All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I was just telling Nicole that it's beautiful weather, and uh, I'm so grateful that, that we have some really great attendees with us tonight that they're choosing to join us and, and learn about nutrition. And we are so fortunate tonight to have Nicole Roach with us. She is a registered dietitian, certified dietitian nutritionist, and I am very fortunate to work with her at Lenox Hill Hospital, and she is a wealth of information. And I know that our patients are so interested in talking about nutrition and so interested in getting tips and advice. I think that for a topic that's so important to health overall, as providers, we are often very, very much not taught much about how to really guide our patients with healthy eating in school. And so a lot of times we're telling patients eat well, exercise, you know, but not giving them the actual tips that they need. So we would be lost without our, our uh, dietitian. So we're so grateful to have you with us. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Rachel Narwald. I'm the nurse practitioner with Preventive Cardiology. I work with Dr. Andre Dunbar and Dr. Eugenia Gianos. So if I haven't had the pleasure to meet you in person, I hope that that changes in the future. And thank you again so much for joining us. And I don't want to hold it up any longer. We're, we're here it's National Nutrition Month. So Nicole, without further ado, please take it away. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Nicole. Um, I am one of the registered dietitians at Lenox Hill Hospital, like Rachel had mentioned. I work inpatient there on most of their cardiac units, um, including their CCU. And I'm so happy to talk to you guys tonight, um, especially since it's National Nutrition Month. So it's very exciting. And again, yes, thank you all for being here with like this gorgeous weather. I know you could probably be doing other things, um, but we're really happy that you're here tonight. So with that being said, um, I'm definitely going to talk about a bunch of different topics. And if you have any questions, um, you can chat them over to Rachel at any time. Um, yes, I'm sorry. That was the one thing I forgot to say. Please put any questions that you guys have at any time into the chat box. And I will pose those to Nicole. Uh, I will likely be interjecting. It's very interactive. So at any point you have a question, go ahead and toss it in there and we'll make sure to address that. Yes, for sure. Please feel free to ask anything. Um, so with that being said, we can get started. Um, so like we were saying, it is National Nutrition Month and this occurs every March um, annually. It's a really exciting time of the year for us as dietitians because it's a time for us to kind of, you know, celebrate what we do on the day to day. And it's a time for the community to kind of get involved with it. Um, and it's a chance for everyone to come and try to learn about making, you know, informed and better food choices, maybe developing some different healthy eating styles. Um, even we can include, you know, physical activity and just overall generally health and well-being. Um, so it's a really fun time for us as dietitians. And I hope you guys can, you know, take some information away from this. And again, this happens every year. It's every March and it's through the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. So they're the ones who kind of organize it each year. Um, so with that being said, the Academy each year, they do come up with a couple of different themes and topics and different takeaway points. There are several of them. I have just included three in this, you know, PowerPoint because we only have a certain amount of time. But if you guys are interested in learning about some of the other ones, you definitely can go on again. It's the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And there's some other talking points that you guys can explore there as well. If, you know, you find this interesting and you want to keep learning more. Um, but the ones that I've kind of chosen to go over tonight are ones that I feel are important and that I feel passionate about. So the three that I'm going to go over with you guys, they are in regards to eating a variety of nutritious foods and incorporating more plant-based options. Um, the second one is about creating tasty foods at home and including meals and snacks that we can tailor to, you know, your cultural and your religious preferences because we want to be mindful of that. And then last one that I think is like super important um, that I feel very strongly about is when you should see, you know, an expert to help you with your nutrition goals. So really when you should be seeing a dietitian and we can kind of talk about how you can find them and the difference between, you know, a dietitian and a nutritionist. Um, so for the first topic, we have eating a variety of nutritious foods. Um, so what this really means is that we want to incorporate foods from, from all of the different food groups. And I think that this is really important to talk about, 
Um, now, because there are so many different diets out there, um, a lot of different fad diets, there's a lot of different, you know, elimination diets. There's a lot of talk about like, quote unquote, superfoods. Um, and I think it's important for everyone to kind of know and understand that a generally healthy diet um, has room for everything. Uh, you know, I really believe everything in moderation is feasible um, and that we can kind of work with you to establish that. And we want to make sure that, you know, we're not excluding a food or a food group unless there's like a true medical reason to be doing so. Um, of course, if that was the case, we want to keep that in mind and we can work around that. But, you know, there's really, aside from that, no diet that needs us to remove anything entirely. Um, and I also think it's important to know that there's not just one superfood that if we eat that, that's going to make us have, you know, a diet that's better or healthier than somebody else's. It's really about incorporating foods from all the food groups that are important. Um, so for you guys to kind of see that, I've included what we call the plate model. Um, and this is through myplate.gov, which is another really great interactive website. There's a lot of resources. There's a lot of tools on that. So if you guys want to visit that, you know, on your own time, it's a really great place that I like to promote as well. Again, this is the plate model and it comes from that website. Um, and what it does is it breaks down our plate into, I would call a puzzle almost. There's a couple of different pieces. Um, we have the fruits, we have our veggies, we have our grains, our protein, and then our dairy. Um, and for me, this works because I'm a very visual learner. So I kind of like to see what my plate should be looking like. Um, and this is in reference to about a nine inch dinner plate, just to give you guys a good reference. Um, and this shows us that we do want to incorporate all the different food groups, but it also helps us to see good portion control as well. Uh, because a lot of times you'll hear people, they'll tell you like, oh, I eat fruits. I eat vegetables, I eat all of these things, but maybe we're not necessarily eating the correct portions of that. So this not only shows us, yes, we want all of the foods, but this is kind of how we want to, you know, model our plate. And if you're a visual learner like myself, you actually can go on my plate or you could even go, I've seen it on Amazon before, you can go online and order like a literal plate of this and it has grooves and edges. So you can kind of like place your food on there and kind of really map it out to the right portions. So it's kind of a cool thing to do um, if you feel like you can't figure it out on your own. Um, you know, another thing you might hear just in regards to when we talk about eating, you know, a variety of different foods, I have it on here. Um, a lot of times we as dietitians say it all the time, we'll tell our patients to color your plate. Um, and what that basically means is, again, you're just getting foods from a variety of different options, that's all. Um, and we say color your plate because when you have a lot of color on your plate, there's a good chance that you are having different fruits, different vegetables, you're having a grain, you're having a protein. Um, we don't want to see your plate being all one color. Like we don't want a totally beige plate. You know, we want to see it colorful and pretty. Um, and that ensures we're getting all of the different things we need. And that really is why we want to have foods from all the different food groups. Um, if we, you know, eliminated one group or if we only ate one group of food, we're missing out on the vitamins and the minerals and, you know, the different macro and micronutrients that we could get from those groups that we may be eliminating or only eating one variety of. Um, so this is the actual serving sizes. Um, so again, my plate is more of a visual sort of way to kind of accomplish this. Whereas this is, you know, this is numbers, this is math. So for those of you who are more maybe number people or more statistical, um, this slide might be of benefit for you. And for those of you who are, are number people out there, I'm sure we could get the slides sent out so you could have these numbers for yourself to reference. Um, again, this is just the different serving sizes for our fruits, our veggies, our grains, meat, poultry, seafood, beans, you know, nuts, seeds, fats, and dairies. Um, and it kind of breaks it down to different servings, you know, per day or per week. Um, and again, for those of you who are more visual learners like myself, you know, we're referencing, you know, three ounces of seafood on here. For me, that really doesn't mean too much, um, but three ounces of seafood, what that would look like to you, um, that would be the size of, you know, a checkbook. Um, and then if we look at, you know, in the left corner, we're talking about meat and poultry, and it says the serving size for that is about three ounces. Um, so for our more visual learners out there, what that looks like is, you know, 
the size of your hands, uh, the palm of your hand, I should say, maybe a smaller palm um, or like a deck of cards or um, your computer mouse. So that's another good visual reference just in regards to serving sizes. And Nicole, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there maybe are some uh, resources out there that sort of have some of those visual aids with like, they'll show you, you know, these are your serving sizes for general yes. things just to can kind of be more in your mind. Yes, definitely. There's a lot of um, those visuals too, in regards to fruits and like the fruits, they'll tell you like, it should be like the size of a golf ball or a tennis ball or like a ping pong ball. And you definitely can find a lot of those visual references online. I specifically like to look, like I said, on my myplate.gov, or if you go on the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, those are two really good resources. And I like them because they're vetted websites. Um, and I think that that's really important anytime you're getting nutrition information, because there is so much information out there specifically in regards to nutrition. Um, and we want to make sure it's accurate. So anything that ends in like .gov, .edu, um, dot web, dot net, these tend to be good, reliable resources that I would, you know, suggest to my own patients. Perfect. Thank you so much for making that yeah. point. I, I often bring that up with patients and just say, listen, there is so much information out there. It's yes. overwhelming. A lot of it's bad, yes. <laughs> Some yes. of it's good. you know, so I think that there can be a really, um, tough choice with there being kind of information overload for patients where there's yes. so much that they just feel overwhelmed and they're almost like, you know what, forget it. This is causing stress. I don't even want to do this. Or on the flip side, then being way too restrictive, you know? So I, I think it's so important to have um, someone like you to guide where you're basically empowering, educating the patients to say, listen, this is what we're going for and how to work that into their lifestyle. Yes, I agree 100%. It's exactly what you said. It's either, you know, information overload. Um, and then sometimes that can make us shy away, um, which is not what we want to be seeing. And then sometimes too, it's, you know, it's information that might not be, you know, trusted or vetted, um, which can then be confusing because you might think, you know, you're doing the right thing when in reality, maybe we're not getting it from the best source. And that's really no one to fault um, because you were, you know, trying to make the right choices. Yes. So it can be, I totally got it. It can be confusing, but that's, you know, what we're here for. And we're so happy to, you know, help and clarify those things. Absolutely. Yes. Um, but are there any other questions in regards to that, or you want to move on to the next no, one? Thank you. Yeah. You can absolutely keep going. I'm sure I'll be interjecting throughout. Okay. okay. <laughs> so Let's do it then. You. <laughs> um, so the next one, um, our next slide, this is about incorporating more of those plant-based options. Um, and I thought that this was really important to talk about too, just because at least, you know, on my day-to-day -day working in the, you know, cardiac units in the hospital, we are trying to do more plant-based options. We're really trying to promote it. Um, and I also just think too, now in general, um, outside the hospital, plant-based options are becoming another popular sort of thing out there. Um, and there's definitely a lot of benefits for it. There's, you know, health benefits. So choosing more plant-based options can help us decrease our risk, you know, for diabetes, um, for different cardiac issues. So like high cholesterol or hypertension, um, it can help to be preventative against cancer because it's very um, anti-inflammatory, like an anti-inflammatory way of eating, one may say. Um, it helps out with our gut health and like digestive functioning because there's a lot of fiber in it. So there's definitely, you know, so many health benefits. And then on the flip side, there's a lot of environmental benefits too. Um, you know, believe it or not, choosing more plant-based options, um, you know, produce actually requires less water and actually less land to kind of generate compared to livestock wood, which I was very shocked to, you know, learn myself. Also too, there's less, um, greenhouse gas omission if we're using plant-based food, um, which is a great thing. And then there's a lot of different cultural and religious reasons why we might choose a plant-based diet. You know, some cultures or religions may want us to shy away from shellfish or pork, or perhaps we can't have, you know, dairy in combination with certain foods, um, which would, you know, lead us to a plant-based choice. So whatever is kind of you, you are leading or your guiding reason for getting there. Um, I'm okay with, as long as we kind of, you know, get there, that works for me and whatever is, you know, inspiring you to choose plant-based again, there's so many benefits to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Keep going. No, 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 go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> 
I was just going to say that I think that a lot of people uh, ask me if they need to be focused on uh, getting organic all the time. So, you know, grass fed beef or organic raised chicken, if they're having chicken. And I'd specifically love for you to talk about what you feel as far as with seafood, with fish, like farm raised versus wild caught. Cause there are some people that also worry about like the sustainability, you know, of, of eating fish. So I'd love for you to touch on that. Yeah. So I mean, personally, um, for me, what I tell people in regards to that, um, I usually tell them, don't worry about it because at least a lot of the patients that I work with, um, to get someone to eat a, like a piece of salmon, that's a win for me, <laughs> yes. you know? So it's like trying to get someone to move from maybe having, you know, a cheeseburger or a steak to trying to maybe have salmon or, you know, chicken, just a, a better healthy option. So for me, I, I would, you know, say, I'm happy with whatever you're having, because at the end of the day, I do feel like that would be a better choice. Um, I do tell people who are interested in eating organic foods, go ahead, you know, get the organic food if that's what you want. But I also want people to understand that if you're eating something that is organic, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that's the stamp of health. You know what I mean? Um, and that's yeah. something really important to keep in mind because you could get, you know, organic veggies, you know, and then go home and you're like deep frying them, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. So I, always, so I always tell people, um, you know, if you have the means, if you have the funds to get organic and you feel that's important for you, go for it. Sure. Um, but again, remembering that that's not going to be, you know, the make or break, at least in my eyes, for me, I'm happy that you, maybe you're eating a vegetable or you're, you're eating fruit, you know, yes. um, and sometimes I see patients in the hospital who don't necessarily have the means to eat organic foods because it is a little bit more expensive. Um, so again, what I tell them is if the option was to eat a non-organic piece of fruit or to not have the fruit, I would, I'm so happy that you're eating the fruit. Yes. And I may have stolen this from you, Nicole, from one of your <laughs> other talks when I heard you talk, but I think you had referenced uh, choices, sort of simplifying it, but saying unwise, better, best. And I loved that because it was like, okay, our unwise yes. choice is the fried, right? The better is like, oh, you know, maybe, okay, I'm going to have a salad or whatever. There might be a little bit of cheese on it. So I'll eat it, you know, and then the best would maybe be like, you know, your, your wild caught salmon with your, you know, organic vegetables, but to right. kind of have like a scale where yes. you're working amongst that. Exactly. Yes, for sure. Like, you know, I love that that saying, I think that that's great. Um, there's different levels to everything. Um, and for someone maybe who isn't necessarily at the point of, you know, eating organic, maybe they are having more of those burgers or, and fries and steaks and more of those unhealthy choices, maybe to jump all the way to organic is something that doesn't necessarily seem feasible right now. So maybe going from that unwise to, um, the better choice, that would be more feasible. And then it's a ladder, you know, once you kind of master that, then you go to that quote unquote best choice. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Of course. Yeah. And that kind of, you know, brings me into this slide as well on um, the idea of it being a ladder almost, or almost, um, I would call it a spectrum because a lot of times I do feel like plant-based eating, people think that when you say that to them, they're like, I'm a vegan or <laughs> I'm now a vegetarian and I'll never eat meat again. And it's something that they feel is almost unattainable. Like they can't really accomplish at all. Um, and plant-based eating is something that I want people to be aware of. It's a spectrum. Um, you don't have to be a vegan. A vegan is, you know, the most restrictive you eat no animal products. So you, you don't need to do that. You know, if that's not what works for you, you don't have to be a full vegetarian either. If that's not what works for you. Um, it's a spectrum. So while being a vegan excludes all animal products, and that's the most restrictive all the way on the other end of the spectrum, we have what we would call a semi or a flexitarian. And that's someone who consumes mostly vegetarian meals, but they sometimes have animal products. And then you have this in between where maybe you have someone who eats fish, but no other, you know, animal sources of protein. You have someone who eats just dairy or just eggs, or maybe a combination of dairy and eggs. And again, it's kind of what works best for you with your lifestyle, with your culture, your religion, you know, your preferences, you know, the foods you like, um, you know, again, your different medical conditions. So there's a lot of different things to kind of take into account to figure out which column on this specific slide works for you. Um, and then our next slide, this kind of 
has a different, um, a bunch of different tips um, and ways that you can kind of tackle having more plant-based meals in your option, because again, it might be something that's difficult at first. Um, so these are just some tips to kind of get you there. Um, you may have heard about doing a meatless day of the week. Meatless Monday is a phrase that I'm sure is thrown around a lot. So the idea of that is just having one day of the week it doesn't have to be Monday necessarily, where you're kind of having you know, no animal products. And again, it doesn't have to be Monday, whatever day kind of works best for you. Um, and if you feel like you can't maybe commit to a whole day at first, maybe you just do one meal on Monday and see how you do with that. So that's one way to kind of ease into it. Um, the next bullet point has the idea of choosing an animal protein as a side rather than a main course. So maybe going from having, you know, chicken as the center star of your plate to moving that as you know, a side, um, a salad is a really great example of that, right? Maybe you make your salad, you know, really big in a bowl with, you know, lettuce or spinach. Um, you know, you could do kale, whatever you want to use as your base. And then you could add veggies, you could add grains in there, you could add beans, and then maybe you do some shrimp and some, or some chicken. Um, so kind of moving protein as a side rather than the main course, that's a good way to kind of ease yourself into it. Um, I really like this next bullet point, which kind of suggests that we take maybe a traditional animal protein meal and we kind of decrease the amount of that animal protein and increase the amount of plant food. So a burger, for example, you could chop up mushrooms and kind of add that into the mix. Um, again, increases your fiber from the plants, decreases that animal protein. Another one that I do all the time, um, if you have meatloaf, this is really good in the winter, you could add chopped up, you know, red peppers go really nice into that. You could do chopped up carrots, um, even oatmeal goes really good into that. And again, you can kind of decrease the amount of meat in it and you're increasing the amount of plant-based foods and the fiber in that. Um, and that's a really good tip too for like picky eaters as well. Sometimes adding in a vegetable into a meal you already know you like and are familiar with it because once it's really blended in there, you can't even taste it. So that's another good way to increase these plant-based foods, especially in our picky eater population. And then the last two bullets, they're kind of, you know, they're easier ones just going for maybe like a nut-based milk or an oat milk over cow milk, and then just trying to have a fruit maybe as like your dessert or your snack throughout the day. Nicole, what do you think about some of these new, um, like the impossible burger, like these, you know, meat alternatives? Yeah, so there's definitely there's a lot of different ones out there, um, which can kind of be tricky because again, sometimes we see something and it says like meatless or like vegan or vegetarian and sometimes these are like buzzwords or like trigger words and we're like oh this must be healthy. Um, mm -hmm. So I always really encourage people to explore the food label you do want to see what else is in there because a lot of times there can be a lot of, you know, added you know, what we call junk in it, they may actually be very high in fat, especially saturated fat. Um, if they're using like a lot of like coconut based, um, like oils in it. And again, you know, there is some room, a uh, small amount of room for saturated fat in the diet. But if you're having a lot of these products, you could be taking in more saturated fat than we would really be recommending. Um, Morningstar is usually a pretty decent brand. Um, and I really like Dr. Prager's. They're another really good brand as well. Um, so, it, you know, it's always important to explore and definitely reading the food label. Um, and then another good brand, not necessarily for, you know, a meat alternative, um, but another popular brand out there, which is just incorporating more plant-based option um, is Bonza. So they're a chickpea-based pasta. So that's a kind of way to just get a little bit more, you know, plant protein and fiber in your pasta. Absolutely. Thank you so much for talking about, you know, reading the labels. Cause I think that's the tricky thing, right? Marketing, they're trying to get you to buy their product. You right. know, they're going to market it as healthy. Yes. I think a lot of patients are already comfortable, maybe looking for hidden sodium, hidden salt, um, hidden sugars and things, you know, but maybe not so much with, with the meat alternatives. Cause it's 
I think it's a little bit becoming more popular, more sort of right. mainstream. Um, I love Morningstar as well, Morningstar Farms. I think that's great. Yes. And I think I loved when you had touched on earlier when you were talking about, you know, some people make these choices out of ethical choices or out of environmental choices. And, and that's something to consider, you know, if, if you're somebody that's choosing not to eat meat because of those options and you, you miss a burger and you want to have an impossible burger every now and then, right. but you keep in mind, it's not a health food per se, you know, and not necessarily healthier than meat at all. So exactly. Um, that's really important. Um, there's actually this thing, um, you know, that we sometimes talk about at work and it's kind of like this, um, like an index scale almost. And it's kind of assessing like how healthy of an alternative something is specifically in this plant-based population or how healthy someone's diet is when they're removing, you know, animal products. Because a lot of times you'll see people are, you know, removing animal products, but then they're replacing it with like bagels and like muffins and a lot of yeah. refined carbohydrates. So it's almost like, okay, you're not having animal products, but are we really doing anything that's that much better for our health. You're getting all these refined sugars now, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we've often said like sometimes people with, with vegetarian diets can be unfortunately very much unhealthy yes. because, you know, they haven't really learned, you know, kind of how to make those healthy swaps yet. Exactly. It can be hard. And it's, again, it all goes back to, there's so much information out there and it, you yes. hear like, oh, being a vegetarian is good, um, right. but we don't necessarily know how to execute it sometimes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, any other questions in regards to that for no, me? No, thank you. This was a great slide. That was wonderful. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Um, we'll go on to our next um, topic then. Um, the other, you know, point we were going to talk about from National Nutrition Month is about, you know, cooking foods at home, um, the benefits, the obstacles, kind of how to address those things. Um, so there's definitely a lot of good reasons why we should be cooking at home. Um, a couple of them that I have on here that we're going to touch on is the fact that you're in control, um, the cost effect and the fact that it actually can be fun and, you know, social. So in regards to being in control of what you're cooking, I think that that is the number one benefit of actually cooking at home. You're in control of both the ingredients and the portion size, which when you dine out, you have very limited control, I will say, of those things. I don't want to say no control because I always love to tell my patients, be vocal when you're dining out, ask questions, ask for substitutes. Um, if you don't understand something on the menu, ask. So you do have some control, but not the same as when you're at home. So in regards to, you know, the ingredients, um, you can choose fresh foods. You know, if you want to eat, you know, fresh fruits, fresh veggies, getting fresh, you know, proteins, you absolutely can do that. And you know that you're doing that. You also too, when you're eating at home, you tend to get a significantly decreased amount of salts, fat, and sugar in cooking. You know, restaurants want food to taste good. They want you to keep coming back for more. And unfortunately, you know, salt, fat, sugar, that's how they're going to do it. Um, where when you're at home, you know, you can make use of different ingredients, you know, you could use fresh herbs and spices, you know, there's so many other things to make the food taste well, seasoning wise, different cooking methods out there. So when you're at home, you can kind of pick what works for you. And inadvertently, you'll see a decrease in these things that restaurants tend to really increase in their mm -hmm. recipes. And then the last thing, just in regards to ingredients, which I, you know, feel like is important is you can kind of tailor your meals to address any specific food allergies or, you know, medical conditions you might have. So like if you, you know, were allergic to fish or if you were lactose intolerant, or maybe you have celiac disease, um, you can kind of tackle this better at home. It can sometimes be difficult when you're dining out and that could be sometimes uncomfortable if you know, you're know you in a large group and people are trying to pick where to go. Um, same thing with medical conditions. You know, Maybe if you're diabetic, it can be concerning if you're eating out and you're like, I don't know if this place has whole wheat bread or whole wheat pasta. Um, so sometimes eating at home, you can kind of do what you know is best for your own health and your own body. 
And then in regards to, you know, portion size, you're definitely in control of that. Um, definitely restaurants, they give you portion sizes that are much larger than necessary. A lot of times it's enough for like two meals. Um, so when we're out, I mean, I am guilty of this too. If there's like a big bowl of pasta in front of me, I'm going to eat way more of that pasta when I'm out compared to if I was at home, you know? So sometimes when you're eating at home, we just have better control of portion sizes just because we're eating to when we know we're hungry rather than this was what was put in front of us. A lot of us were taught as kids, you know, to clear your plate before you got to leave the table, which is not always the best practice. Um, and it sticks with us. And then we're in a restaurant and we're trying to clear our plate, you know, so being at All home. Order. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All of it. All of it. So at home, you can kind of control that a little bit better. Yes. And, you know, do you kind of, um, you know, give tips, Nicole, for like maybe, um, you know, pretty much when your meal is served that you are then asking them to like wrap up half of it, you know, to take home in a doggy bag or even like getting an appetizer as an entree and like a side yes. salad, you know, things like that uh -huh. for sort of addressing that when you are yes, no absolutely um realistically um life events you know birthdays occasions like all of these things are going to come up oh sorry about that um all of these things are going to come up and i don't want people to not know how to address that because it would be unrealistic to say you know you're never going to eat out again and turn the blind eye so yes definitely um telling, you know, people, or when you're ordering, asking them to only give you half of the meal and then wrap up the other half. That way you're less likely to overeat. You could do that. Definitely, like you said, getting maybe an appetizer and then a side salad. That's kind of another good way to go about having more portion control at a meal. Um, if you're going out to eat with someone, you could also, you know, you could get a salad and maybe they could get, you know, more of that like fun food option. And then you guys could share it. That kind of helps out with portion control. And then, you know, you could, like I was saying, be vocal too, in regards to the ingredients we were saying, you know, ask about what's in the food. You could always ask for, you know, things on the side, you know, sauces, gravies, condiments. Um, and then just knowing good words to look for on the menu. I always tell people something that says, you know, steamed, baked, boiled, grilled, much better options to see than something that says, you know, deep fried or battered, even such so it really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I love that you have the bullet point of cost effective. Cause I will tell you that some of the biggest pushback we get and concerns from patients is that eating healthy is more expensive and they're concerned about that. So I'd love yes. to, you know, hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I agree 100%. And I, I think I too, for a long time, I was like, um, it's expensive to eat healthy, which is not necessarily the case. Um, if you try to buy seasonal food. So buying what's in season, that will always be, you know, cost effective. It's much cheaper. So doing that is helpful. Buying in bulk, if you're able to, that will kind of help to bring down the cost as well. Um, and again, a lot of times the amount of money you're spending in a restaurant for a meal, if you think about what you could buy in the grocery store for that, you get so much more, you know, bang for your buck, you can get more meals from it. So it really is cost effective when you kind of sit down and look at it. Um, so I think it's, I think it's great. I mean, I know like so many times I'm like, oh, I'm not going out this weekend. I'm going to be so bored, but then I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to save so much money by staying in, you know? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, we, we tell people too, that it doesn't have to be like fresh produce all the time, you know, right. that as long as you're getting, uh, first of all, making sure, like, especially with canned, I think you have to watch the sodium, watch that there's nothing added. And with frozen, as long as it's just the vegetable, it's not like additional sauces that might be right. adding things, Yes. That, you know, then you don't have to worry about, oh, I didn't cook that broccoli and it, you know, went bad in the fridge and I wasted all that money. Exactly. 100%. And, you know, everything you're saying is so accurate. And even to, if you were to buy, I know even for myself, if I buy fresh vegetables, I, you know, it's just me in my apartment. I'm always like, it's going to go bad. I'm cooking for one. You could definitely freeze vegetables. Um, if you buy them fresh, that's totally fine. And then you have them for later on, you could possibly cook a meal with them now and then freeze them for later. So that's really good to do as well. Um, so you don't have to necessarily be fearful that they're going to go bad, but yes, making use of those other tools, um, when you're able to can also be very helpful. Absolutely. And then, you know, last, um, it can be fun. It can be social. I mean, if you're having a party, it's always fun to have people make home cooked meals and then everyone brings something to it. Um, 
cooking is like a really good date as well. Um, for families, it's nice, you know, to have your kids involved. So it's definitely a fun interactive experience cooking at home. Mm -hmm. Um, so then our next slide kind of addresses some of those obstacles to cooking at home. So a lot of times people tell me they don't know how to cook, they don't have time to cook, um, their family won't eat a healthy meal, or they feel like eating healthy is too expensive. Um, so we kind of, you know, talked about the expense part of it already. In regards to not knowing how to cook, you know, I always tell people you don't need to be a chef try to pick a recipe with a few ingredients, um, you will likely conquer that better and you'll feel more confident. I like to watch, you know, short cooking videos if it's on, you know, Instagram or TikTok, whatever it is, because they're short and they kind of show you snippets on how to cook the meal and kind of execute it. And I know if I can at least see that being done, I feel more confident about that. Um, so that can be helpful, you know, in regards to not having time to cook, definitely meal prepping goes so far. I know the last thing I want to do when I get home is like make a huge meal for myself. So I always say meal prep as best as you can. Um, you know, sometimes you could just make a main protein, um, make it kind of plain. And then throughout the week, you can dress it up with different things. So like if you made, you know, grilled chicken tonight, maybe you could have it one night in a salad, one night you'd have it with a vegetable, and then maybe one night you shred it up and you make it into a taco. Um, so that counts as meal prepping. You could also, you know, buy vegetables that are already chopped up. If that's something that's helpful for you to save time, uh, meal, you know, delivery services. So like you could get, you know, your food or your groceries delivered through Amazon or Peapod that kind of saves a lot of time. So there's definitely a lot of ways to kind of cut down on the time and give yourself, you know, just a small block during the week to cook and kind of have that stuff saved for you. So you don't necessarily have to rely on restaurants or take out food. Absolutely. And I love what you're saying with like kind of making like bulk proteins, you know, I think that's great. Like we have so many options uh, with like a slow cooker, you know, or an instant yes. pot. If you have that, you know, the instant pot, I personally love it. Shameless plug for it. I, I'm not getting a kickback from them, but I think that it's an amazing tool. It cooks so much faster yes. and right. And, you know, and it can be fun because then you might think, oh, I can try this recipe or I can try, you know, I never liked Brussels sprouts as a kid, but this recipe looks great or right, exactly. You know, a, a different preparation, I think can sometimes just be a game changer for a food that you thought you maybe didn't even like, you 100%. know, hundred percent. I love instant pot too, or like a crock pot, um, even just putting something in the oven. And I tell people who work from home, like yeah. throw the stuff in the crock pot, throw it in the instant pot, stick it in the oven, and then go on your zoom meeting. And then by the time <laughs> the meeting's over, your meal's going to be done. You know, it That's requires great. such little effort. Um, I, so I agree as well. I think that they're excellent tools for cooking. Absolutely. And uh, one of our participants, I love this. She said, cooking lessons can be a great investment, lasts for life, could be a good gift for a person who wants to learn. I love yes, that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my one best friend, um, she's also a dietitian. And, you know, after a while, we got bored of like doing the same old things. We would go to cooking classes together just because they're fun. And it was a different, you know, way to hang out and still yeah. do something, but kind of doing something we enjoyed and learning a new skill. So yes, it definitely makes it a great gift as well. I love that. And, you know, I, I think that you could even do sort of your own thing. Like you were saying, there's so many online videos now. Maybe yes. you could even have a night, it's like a Zoom night with your girlfriends and you guys pick a video. You all have your own ingredients. You're kind of doing it at home. You know, Absolutely. like you said, finding ways to incorporate it, make it fun, make it social, you know, so it's not such a chore because we're not always going to want to do it, you know, but. <laughs> of course, of course. And that, you know, that was the other um, thing I was going to say, don't think of it as a chore. You know, if you don't know how, or if you don't have time, a lot of times we tend to see cooking as a chore um, and then it's the last thing we want to do. So kind of think of it as, you know, maybe a learning experience if you're making a new recipe or think of it as you're doing something nice for your body um, by cooking a healthy meal, thinking of it as something that could be maybe fun or enjoyable. I think that having that more positive mindset and attitude really goes a long way in regards to cooking as well. Absolutely. And then, you know, just in regards to your family not eating healthy, it's always easy, you know, to kind of cook and batch and maybe make something plain for yourself and then dress it your way and then having your family, you know, dress their food their way that they want. That's a great tip. For sure. I definitely, I, listen, my family is a, <laughs> that we can never agree. So that really works well in our house. <laughs> you won't tell my parents that. 
<laughs> no. Um, and then, you know, just to kind of, you know, piggyback on what we were saying before about learning like a different way to cook. Um, a lot of times adding these different, you know, cultural backgrounds into cooking that can not only help us to celebrate, you know, our own cultures, but it can help to maybe we can learn about someone else's culture. And there's so many different cooking styles and prep methods, um, in regards to ethnic cooking, which we can learn about. We can learn about new ingredients or even try maybe a different food that we have never even experienced before. And this can kind of add to that, you know, joy of cooking, maybe learning something we didn't know. And now we understand that we like a food. Um, and for someone who maybe doesn't cook, and this seems like even like a bigger task or a bigger fish mm -hmm. to fry. Um, what I always tell people is if you're going to kind of explore like a different cultural way to cook or a different, you know, cuisine, sometimes it's smart to pick a food that you already know you like and see how another culture prepares it. So like for myself, um, I like eggplant, but I felt like there was only a couple of ways to prepare it. But then I was, you know, researching on the internet and I came across, you know, baba ganoush, which is more of a Mediterranean way to kind of prepare that. And I was like, great, this is in food I like. I know I'm going to eat it. Um, it's just a different method. So kind of exploring that when you're trying to uncover different, you know, cuisines and ways to cook. I think that that's helpful as well. Absolutely. And, you know, we talk a lot about, I think, benefits from food. And I love that you mentioned the anti-inflammatory um, uh, properties earlier. I think sometimes people don't realize how beneficial different spices can be, right? Oh, for sure. And, you know, spices when you're talking are... about, you know, turmeric and, you know, cinnamon even, and, you know, things that maybe we're not cooking per se with that, that often that those can really be beneficial, especially for trying to limit salt, but, you know, yeah. still having the food be flavorful. Yes, for sure. There's so many different spices, different herbs out there. Um, and again, a lot of times we don't always know how to use them and they do have so many different, you know, anti-inflammatory properties. Um, they're so good for us. They help us to kind of, like you said, decrease that salt intake. So kind of exploring um, and figuring out what maybe spices you like and then seeing what pairs with them or how to incorporate them into different meals. Um, super important. Yes. And even too, I tell people, you know, you can get, you don't have to get fresh herbs. You can get them dry. There's so many different ways to purchase them. Um, they even now have, which I really like, you could get in the supermarket. They're like frozen cubes of like cilantro or garlic already crushed up. Um, and that is so helpful for cooking because you don't have to worry about maybe getting fresh or you don't have to worry about chopping or if you're not a <laughs> fan of dried um, and they stay great in the freezer. So I really like that as well. Yes. Um, and then our last um, slide or two, last topic, I should say, is just about when you should see an expert in regards to your nutrition goals. And there's really no right or wrong answer to this question. Um, there's so many different reasons why you might see a dietitian. Um, so this is really variable person to person, you know someone might have just found out they have diabetes and they don't understand their diet, or maybe someone is recovering from an eating disorder and, you know, they need the support of a dietitian to heal their relationship with food. Um, maybe someone's pregnant and they're not gaining enough weight during their pregnancy. Um, so these are all valid reasons to see a dietitian and they are so different from each other. Um, so there's really no right or wrong reason or time, um, or want to see a dietitian. I think a lot of people think sometimes we're the food police and we're just here for weight <laughs> loss, which is not the case at all. I promise we're not here to police you. Um, but you know, I think it's a great idea to see a dietitian. And even if you don't have one of those, you know, medical issues that warrant it, maybe you, maybe you're, you know, you are interested in weight loss and you just need someone to keep you accountable. So there really are so many different reasons why to, you know, see one, you can always ask, you know, your doctor for a referral. And a lot of times different places, um, they have a dietitian on staff. So maybe if you were someone who gets dialysis, um, there's always a dietitian on staff at the infusion center. If you were someone who has, you know, cancer and you're getting chemo at an infusion center, there's usually a dietitian there. A lot of different, um, GI doctors, um, they can refer you to a dietitian or they have one in their office, in their practice. So it's always a really great idea to ask your doctor as well. 
And I think that just in regards to this, like when you should see a dietitian, uh, I think it's important to kind of talk about who to see. So you always do want to make sure you're seeing a registered dietitian. Um, And what that means is you're seeing someone who they're licensed, they're credentialed. And what that means is they did um, clinical hours, which is usually anywhere from nine months to a year of clinical hours um, practicing. And then you sit for your board exams and to be registered, you had to have passed your exams. So it's always really important to make sure that that's who you're seeing. Um, A lot of times I know people ask like, what's the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist? Um, And a nutritionist, on the other hand, they don't have the that sort of schooling, they don't have to take those exams um, and licensing, you know, work and tests. So that's the main difference. So, um, which is a very big difference. Um, So I think it's always important to kind of mention that and make sure you're working with someone who is registered, who is practicing um, under certain standards of care, who's licensed. Um, So that's really important as well. Yes. And, you know, Nicole, I think one of the great things is that I love that you pointed out that there's often someone on staff at a lot of the practices. And I think people are more used to knowing that that's a resource, let's say in a diabetic clinic, for example. But what I always want my patients to know is registered dietitians are, are trained with everything. You know, they don't only know, it's not like, you know, medicine where there's kind of like separate specialties. You know, I would say that if you need to see a dietitian, you're going to be able to discuss with him or her the gamut, you know, and they're going to know uh, what to tell you if you do need to think about your diabetic control and they're going to know if heart disease is an issue and they aren't going to say like, Oh no, you know, that's not what I do. Exactly. You know, and I think that that's something that I really want to drive home for people is that most heart healthy diets are all very similar, you know, with kind of those core things. So you're never going to find a provider that isn't going to be able to sort of guide you, you know, with, with your journey, whatever it is in the moment and ideally giving you those strategies for the lifespan. Yes, I agree. Um, so definitely that is so accurate. Um, you know, as I was saying earlier, I work primarily on our cardiac floors, but you know, I cross cover sometimes I'm in our ICU or I'm seeing bariatric patients or I'm seeing, you know, GI patients. So very often you will meet a dietitian who is specialized in a specific area, um, which is like their area of expertise, but they are well versed in other areas. Um, And if you were looking for someone who was specialized in something, maybe for your specific issue or concern, um, you definitely can find someone who has your specific issue that you're looking for. Or at the, at the same time, if you can't maybe find someone who is, you know, that's their field of expertise, they still have that background, that baseline knowledge. And just in, in general, I feel like dietitians are very, you know, driven. We're very type A. We like to learn. So if you maybe are working with one, I know I'm so confident that they will, you know, go above and beyond to kind of research search a little bit more what you maybe want to talk about if that's not their quote unquote expert area, you know? Yes, absolutely. And you know, something else that I think is so important. I love they said, you guys aren't just the food police. It's not just about, oh, they're going to tell everyone to lose weight. You know, what I want people to know is that registered dietitians are on such a level, let's say that there's a new diagnosis, like for example, uh, like diverticulosis. And then all of a sudden your provider tells you, you can never have nuts or seeds again. I don't think that's, you know, really necessarily true anymore. And I think it's important that people know that they can go to a dietitian for these types of things. Or let's say that all of a sudden you have, um, you know, excess uric acid in the blood, or, you know, all of a sudden your sodium levels are low, or all of a sudden uh, you have a new intolerance for something that you can't eat anymore. And you might be at risk of being low in really important electrolytes, you know, potassium, any of those things. And that that's what registered dietitians can do is find out those really important replacements. You might need supplementation. You know, I, I, usually tell people if they're getting a healthy diet that they don't need to be taking vitamins, things like that, but there may be really high level, um, conditions that need to be discussed with an expert to make sure that you're getting the nutrients and the vitamins and minerals that you need. Oh yeah. 100%. I agree. Um, you know, there's a lot of clinical work that goes into, you know, becoming a dietitian, a lot of the different, you know, internships that we are required to do, there's so much clinical time spent. So even if you're not seeing someone who is clinically based like myself in the hospital, um, 
there's so much clinical background. Um, there really is so much medical training behind it that, you know, you can feel confident that you're speaking with someone who can kind of read lab work and understand that. I know my mom all the time, she gives me her labs from the doctor and she's like, can you tell me what this means? Um, <laughs> Or, or she'll tell me, you know, like they gave me these results and no one really went over it with me. Like, do you understand it? And I, I'm like, of course I understand it. Um, so you can definitely feel confident that if you're going to a dietitian with lab works or like with a medical diagnosis, which you don't understand that they can kind of clarify that for you as well. Not to say that we are, you know, doctors by any means, but we do have a very strong understanding on a lot of different, you know, medical issues because a lot of those medical issues are what drives the need for a certain diet. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's, it's so important to drive home that there is so much clinical knowledge there that it's not just about, you know, oh, lifestyle changes, you know, no, there, there are some really serious considerations that maybe uh, needed to be discussed that you won't have time to talk to, you know, your doctor or your nurse practitioner right. about, you know, so it's, it's so important. And I know that we say this a lot um, with our, our clinical practices, having that, you know, multidisciplinary team, you yes. know, that you can go to for your nutrition, for your mental health, you know, for all of those things. And it's such an important part, I think, of overall health, not just heart health, that it's just, you know, a game changer to, to have you all to not only curbside, you know, when we have questions in the hospital, right. but to, be able to refer our patients to, because it, it really is something that needs um, close management, you know, and close follow-up. Yes. I agree. And especially too, like with the multidisciplinary team, um, I would hundred percent agree with that. And I mean, we work so closely with, you know, speech language pathology. So, you know, if you were someone who just had a stroke and you were seeing a dietitian, maybe outside the hospital and, you know, we felt that you were having an issue swallowing, we can refer you to, you know, someone along those lines, a speech language pathologist to help you. Um, if you were someone who was, you know, had an eating disorder, um, and we felt maybe that there was some more, you know, psych issues that needed to be addressed, we can maybe connect you to a social worker who can then connect you to, you know, a psychiatrist or something along those lines. So it is a very multidisciplinary field, um, which is a great thing. Absolutely. And um, I did want to ask um, a question here from yes. our, uh, from an audience member. Uh, she asks, please share your thoughts on trading out regular soda with diet soda and the considerations that we should be aware of if choosing diet soda. I think that's a great question. Yeah, I, I get asked this actually a lot in the hospital. Um, what I kind of tell my patients is um, it's your it's really your personal choice. Um, regular soda, regular iced teas, lemonades, juices, they're going to be loaded with sugar. So it's like you get, you have that one issue to be working with. And then if you suggest, you know, maybe going for like a diet or a sugar-free one, I often get, well, those are filled with chemicals and that can cause <laughs> cancer. So it's almost like, what do you feel is the lesser of the two evils? What I tell patients is if you don't feel comfortable having, you know, a sugar-free drink for whatever reason, um, I would not like to see you drinking a full glass of regular soda, but maybe perhaps having mostly water in your glass and you put a splash of the regular one in. Um, maybe if you were someone who wanted juice and you don't want to, again, go for the diet, the sugar-free one, but you don't want to have the full sugar juice as well. Um, maybe you take, you know, a water, a glass of water and you put some natural fruit in it, or you get like a water bottle that has like the infuser tower and you, inf uh, you infuse the fruit that way. Uh, maybe you could do like a tea, like um, a tea bag, um, and you could get that in like a fruited flavor. I know that, you know, Tazo, uh, that's a personal favorite brand of mine. They have really nice fruited flavor teas. So you can kind of make that overnight. And then it's almost like you have an iced tea in a sense, um, but it's really just a tea bag. So there are some kind of ways to get around it per se, but again, you, you always want to respect um, your patient or your client's wishes. You know, I would never say, you know, you can't have this or you, you have to stay away from this if that's what your belief is. So it's kind of working around those obstacles, meeting in the middle where we have to be. Yeah. And I think, you know, seltzer can be a nice option, you yes. know, like calorie free. And I, I think you're exactly right. Sometimes it's, 
it's a journey. You know, you say, okay, you're having four sodas a day. Maybe we right, right. try one of those, right? Being like, you know, a seltzer and you're still getting the bubbles and you're still getting that. And, you know, I, I have been told that the, um, the, the sort of fake sweeteners in the diet soda is actually so much sweeter than real sugar that you're almost sort of um, retraining your taste buds in a negative way, right? To sort of being craving even more sweet sometimes, more right. carbohydrates. I don't know if that's a proven thing, but I've definitely heard. <laughs> I don't know uh, if it's proven like, either, but I've heard that as well. And yeah. I hear it a lot, actually, especially from my patients. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe it's proven, um, but I, I totally get the idea of it, ta it tastes sweeter. So like, it might not actually be sweeter, um, but it tastes sweeter, which again, you develop almost like um, a tolerance, I guess you would say, which is where that idea that you need more of it comes from. Yes, yes, absolutely. But I think you're right. It's kind of finding that happy medium, making those changes as you can, you know, not overwhelming them with 20 things. But I do think that cutting out that regular soda is such a great first step. You know, as you said, just arming them with tools to see what's going to work for them. Because drinking your calories, obviously, we always kind of recommend to, to avoid that. Uh, yes, exactly. Possible. Of course. It's like the same thing with people who are like going to Starbucks and they're getting like an extra large like Frappuccino. It's like, all right, well, yeah. if you're not going to quit the Frappuccino altogether, maybe could we go down to just a small, yes. I mean, maybe not like every day. I, I really strongly believe in, you know working with people where they are and making small and reasonable goals, um, you know, to tell someone who's having, you know, a very, very poor diet to kind of quit everything they're doing cold Turkey. Um, realistically, we know that's not going to work. So I really think it's about meeting your patient, your client, where they are in their journey and their process and kind of working from there. Absolutely. And like you said, those little things add up, you know, like maybe you don't get the yeah. lip cream on the Frappuccino, right? And exactly. then, you know, then you kind of, you know, then the next time you can make a better choice and a better choice. Exactly. Um, yes. And I sure. do want to be mindful of the time. I could just talk to you about this all night. It's been fantastic. <laughs> I, I would love to pose kind of one um, final question to you. Yeah, of um, course. We, we get a lot of questions um, nowadays about um, intermittent fasting or, you know, time restricted eating. So I'd yeah. love for you to touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So I definitely, um, I am not as well versed in that as I would like to be the research. I feel like on that is like ever changing. Right. Um, and there's definitely now, at least they are starting to show that there are some health benefits to it. Um, in the diabetic population, again, I'm still not as well versed as I would like to be to kind of speak to it either way. But I do believe that if you are going to be intermittently fasting, um, you should definitely be doing so with the guidance of a registered dietitian. Um, especially if you have other medical conditions going on, I think that it's very important that you're doing that with someone who is a professional who feels comfortable talking about it. Um, I personally would never tell someone that they can only be eating from certain hours in the day, um, in very extreme senses. Um, I think a lot of times, at least in my opinion that you see, if you tell someone like you, you can only eat from this time to this time. Um, I know a lot of people who binge eat during those times. Um, mm -hmm. and then they're not eating for the rest of the day. So it's almost like putting them on the path for an eating disorder. Um, mm -hmm. so I do think that really clear goals need to be established. There really need to be you know, fine lines and boundaries and really good understandings if that's a route that you're going to, going to kind of be pursuing. Um, you know, intermittent fasting doesn't mean you get to go crazy for a certain period of time and then, you know, you starve for the rest of the time. We mm -hmm. want to make sure if you are doing this, you're doing it in a mindful and a healthy and a safe manner. Um, and there's definitely different types of intermittent fasting. Um, people will do it for different hours. So I do personally believe if you are going to do that, it should be in a safe time period. I would never want to see somebody only allowing themselves, you know, for eating hours during the day. And then the rest of the day is not eating. I think it should really be done over a safe period of time. Absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head when you said in a mindful way, uh, you know, I think that 
definitely it should be with the guidance of a dietitian. And I think that for some people, it can be a nice tool if people are uh, mindlessly eating, snacking late at night. And for them to have a cutoff time, that's really helpful for them. But I agree, it could be very dangerous for people and putting them in a disordered eating pattern. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't allow sometimes for, you know, social things or life getting in the way, you know? Right. So I think you're it right. Can be flexible. It can be hard. I tried to one time as like an experiment, do it just so I could comment on it to my yeah. patients. Um, and it just didn't work. Like the way my work schedule was, it was like impossible Great. for me to eat. And I was like, okay, this is, you know, not for me personally. <laughs> Agreed. It did not work for me either. I don't think it works for people that have a variable schedule. And like you were saying too, sometimes with families and things, it, it's not realistic. And I don't think uh, you're exactly right that there's enough evidence to say so strongly, oh, this is something, you know, that that's going to make or break. Um, exactly. But, you know, yeah, I'm sure they're still doing evidence. There is some positive things, but I think you're exactly right. It's all individualized. And I think that's so important to have good providers that you can discuss the, the changes in your life and the changes that, you know, you may want to make and also what's realistic and what's going to work best. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I agree. Well, thank you all so much. It's pretty much just about eight o'clock. I, I want to be uh, mindful of people's time and respectful of you, Nicole. Thank you so much. This yes, was fantastic. Thank so you. helpful. And to everyone for joining. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that this has been a great overview. I think it was fantastic touching on some really, really important topics and that you kind of know some good resources to look up on your own now that you know you can reach out. You can reach out to your providers, you know, your, your internist, your, your cardiologist and ask for a suggestion, you know, of somebody to see um, because we can absolutely provide those resources as well. So um, we will definitely definitely be continuing to do our building bridges to the community lecture series monthly. So we'll make sure to share the information for our upcoming talks. We would love to have you back. And uh, maybe I can convince Nicole to come back at some point <laughs> in the future too. And I would love to. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, everyone and have a great night and get out and enjoy that nice weather tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. All right. I'm gonna figure out how to stop the recording. Thank you so much, Nicole. This was amazing. Of course, no problem. Like halfway through, 